today we have Natasha Kaplan talking first. She got her PhD from the University of London King's College Hospital Medical School. And subsequently in 1996, she joined the National Human Genome Research Institute. And she started working on RNA interference. And we thought that was a very important area. So then we hired her and she joined the NCI Center for Cancer Research in 2004 as a senior scientist. She now heads the gene silencing section in the genetics branch. And her title, Functional Annotation of the Cancer Genome via RNA Interference. Natasha. Thank you, Terry. OK, I know everyone can hear me in here. Are we OK? Oh, we have a thumbs up, so we're good. OK, so thanks very much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is what I truly call a story of translational research. So I'm going to tell you and uh, give you a little bit of historical background and then work, talk through some of the work um, that's currently going on predominantly in my laboratory to get, and then some um, published work from other groups to highlight how people are using RNII and what, what its application has been in the translational uh, arena. So why do I call it a translational research story? Well, that's because it started as a, is this the pointer on the top here? Yeah. It, this was a phenomena uh, that we now know was actually being observed in plants and fungi in the early 1990s, but nobody knew what it meant. What it was um, observed as was that in certain situations when particularly um, plasmids that had genes that were introduced in multiple copies into, in this case, petunias or in neurospora, what they saw was not an overexpression of the gene that they were introducing, but actually a silencing. The gene expression was completely suppressed. Now, it was unclear what was the mechanism behind this uh, um, observation until the late 1990s when uh, Craig Mello and Andy Fire published the seminal observation that if you introduce double-stranded RNA into C. elegans shown here, this is a, a, a double-stranded RNA against, double, uh, against GFP, that you silence the gene expression in the, uh, the nematome worm. And what it was shown very quickly was what was, that, was what was occurring here in plants and in neurospora. You were producing double-stranded RNA uh, from these uh, multiple copies of the plasma DNA that was being put in. The cDNAs were following hairpins, and they were being processed um, through what we now know is the RNA interference pathway, which I'll come into in a moment. Then you have the studies of which I was part of um, showing that this was a phenomenon, that, a mechanism that occurred naturally in mammalian cells as well up until the early 2000s. There had been huge debate that there, this was a mechanism that was purely in lower eukaryotes because we have very sophisticated responses to double-stranded RNA, RNA through our immune response, but then myself and, and Tom Tuschel, when he was in Germany, we both showed that you can actually induce this effect in mammalian cells. And then very quickly, this observation was taken to clinical trials starting in the mid-2000s two, and still continuing. And then also we saw being able to scale up and use these, uh, this, exploit this pathway for doing up to whole genome screening analysis um, now in the late 2000s and, and currently. Okay, so before we go too far, I want to make sure everyone in the room is ba has the basics of what I'm talking about in terms of the mechanism, though this is not going to be a mechanistic talk in terms of the RNII mechanism. You're going to hear some of this from other people talking about microRNAs, but this is just to give everyone background. So what we now know, and this is a very simplified version of, of the RNII pathway, but sufficient for this purposes, is that this RNAI mechanism, it, RNA interference, is a naturally occurring gene silencing mechanism that is predominantly being studied through analysis of microRNAs. MicroRNAs are natural mediators of RNAi amongst many others, but these are the prime, the most well studied of all of the microRNAs. MicroRNA genes are uh, expressed in the genome as traditional Pol2 um, genes. Some, many of them are polycystronic. Sometimes microRNAs are within introns of genes. A few are still individual genes. So that sort of every plethora of uh, forms you could find in non-coding RNA, you find them in. But these are are regulate, press the wrong button. These are processed through what's known as the microprocessing complex that contains at a minimum Drosha and DGCRA and potentially many other proteins that have not been fully um, identified. This allows for the processing 
of this hair, unique hairpin structure that you see most microRNAs form. There is then transport through exporting 5 in an active process into the cytoplasm where this forms the RNA-induced silencing complex. But that's um, once the uh, microRNA has been further processed by uh, another enzyme called DISA, again within the complex. The RNA-induced silencing complex, the predominant family of proteins that form the, the key um, catalytic um, domain of this complex are part of the argonaut family of proteins. So in, when in the context of microRNA regulation of gene expression, multiple different members of the argonaut family can all substitute for each other. But what I'm going to be talking about today is here where we're looking at the effects predominantly of one ago protein, ago2, um, which involves the cleavage uh, of a transcript. I'll come on to this in just a moment. I first of all just want to finish describing here. So most, in a naturally occurring set, um, setting, microRNAs will regulate the expression of protein encoding genes through formation of a microRNA com uh, com containing RNA-inducing um, RNA silencing complex or RISC. This will uh, involve mRNA degradation or translational repression of the protein uh, encoding gene that it, it interacts through interactions at the 3' prime UTR. So it's very specific. There are some reports of interactions with other parts of the transcripts, but predominantly it's with the 3' prime UTR. This interaction requires a minimal um, sequence overlap, which is predominantly driven by the 5' prime end of the microRNA sequence of only about six or seven nucleotides. This is known as the seed sequence. Um, and so you end up with a sort of m several mismatches. Why this is drawn as a sort of mismatch interaction with the protein encoding uh, uh, transcript. So this is absolutely key for the regulation of probably over a third of protein encoding genes, so it's a major regulatory uh, mechanism. But I'm only going to touch on this a little more during the course of today because this is a translational um, presentation. So I'm going to be mainly focused on this side, which is where we're using artificial mediators of RNAi, predominantly known either as short hairpin RNAs or SHRNAs or small interfering RNAs or siRNAs that interact now with just one member of the family, AGO2, to induce this as a target transcript cleavage. And the reason that this occurs is because in this case, the mediator, in our case, artificial mediators, have to have an exact match between, in terms of sequence between the siRNA and the target transcript. And this can interact with any point in the target transcript, anywhere, any part of the, um, of the target transcript, 3' UTR coding region or even the 5' UTR. So what can happen is, so the differences that we have are that in this case, we're dealing with gene regulation um, in a natural setting. And here what we can do is we can use this for loss of function analysis. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to come on to a minute. So why, why do we care about long function, uh, loss of function analysis? And there's a really important reason for this. So our ability to profile the, the cancer genome on a large scale has been revolutionized in recent years. So I'm sure as part of this course, you're going to hear a lot about next-gen sequencing. You're going to hear a lot about how we can expression profile um, at a genomic level, at an RNA level, uh, on a very large scale. So we know we can do genome-wide association studies. We can look at genome copy number, epigenetic analysis, sequencing. We can analyze non-coding RNAs. But there's something missing from really all of this, or gene expression analysis. And that, though this has allowed us to look at these molecular changes that underlie many cancers, we need to functionalize them. So this gives us a lot of information, many of it tractable that we can use for improved prognosis, for biomarker detection. But functionalizing, understanding the mechanistic basis of what we're observing in cancers remains a challenge. And we need to have a, a way of doing this on a larger scale. And this is where loss of function analysis through RNII comes in. So currently, though there are methods and alternatives that are starting to be developed, but up until, you know, currently, RNA interference is still probably the most widely used approach for conducting gene-specific loss of function studies in mammalian cells. So what I'm just going to summarize from where we were on that previous slide. What we're looking at here is we have the siRNA that I was talking about earlier. And this could be an SA, sRNA or an shRNA. And I'll explain what those are in more, more detail. But these are usually now being able to be 
um, purchased commercially. Um, they've been pre-designed to match a particular target transcript, which would be shown here. You're forming the AGO2 complex, and you're going to inhibit new protein production. So you are not going to um, induce an immediate effect. It's going to take time. And it's going to be dependent on the half-life of the protein that you're looking at because you're in inhibiting new production. So if you have a very long, stable protein that you're trying to silence by this mechanism, you're not going to necessarily see any effects or you're only going to have, you're going to have to have a form of way, use, a, so for example, a short hairpin RNA that allows you to do a longer-term um, silencing of your gene. But the bottom line is that you're hoping is that by inhibiting protein production, you're going to induce some sort of loss of cellular function that you can assay in some way, whether that's something like a very broad phenotype, such as cell viability, through to a much more precise, mechanistic-based um, assay. So what have people been using it for, including uh, work in my laboratory? We've been, you, you can use it for a lot of for gene function analysis, and I'll mention some of this. You can do it for looking at an entire pathway or network, seeing if you, how the different proteins interact within that. A, an important uh, use of RNA loss of function has been for improving molecular target identification and for, cre uh, for further validation of molecular targets. Then there's looking at how different small compounds, small uh, inhibitors work, or improving cancer therapeutic, and also for biomarker validation. And I'm going to try, through the course of today, touch on some of the various features of how work that we've done in my lab that have, have touched on applications such as these. So before I get into some examples, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page as to what an experiment would look like in the lab. And so I just want to take a quick show of hands. I do this every year in this class. How many people have actually done an RNAi experiment in the lab? Okay, only two. I'm not going to bite. So if you've, if you've done it and it didn't work or there was a problem, only two. That's unusual. Okay, maybe it's just falling out of favor. I don't know. Anyway, so um, RNAi induces a knockdown in the jargon that a lot of people use. It's not actually one I don't particularly care to use, but it's a way of differentiating it from a knockout, which is what we, are we were very much used to um, when, I, when this field developed, where we were used to seeing knockout animals or you're trying to see a complete ablation of a loss of function. What we're hearing is a reduction, ideally at least below a heterozygous state. Okay? Now, that means to do that, you actually have to really carefully optimize what you're doing and how you're inducing this in your cellular system in, in the laboratory. Um, you've got to make sure that the model system is right for asking the question that you're, you want to answer. And that might sound like a really obvious statement. But one of the issues we've come across a lot is, for example, people have, and I'm going to describe one of these studies, that you uh, have a list of genes that we know are overexpressed in a tumor, for example, and you want to silence those because the, the thought is that one of these is a driver of that process of tumorigenesis. If your model system, your cell line, doesn't look anything like the expression profile that you have of the tumors, you're not going to get the result you want. So trying to this is only as good as the models that we have for it. So one of the limitations really is just our cellular models. Eff efficacy and specificity, that's obviously important. And the efficacy is very dependent on what sort of protein you're silencing by this mechanism. So some proteins, if you just tweak the amount of protein that's there in the cell, you're going to see some sort of phenotypic effect. You don't actually even have to get to a heterozygous site to see an effect. But some proteins, you could take out 99.9% .9 of that protein, and that 0.1% is still going to be sufficient to be able to perform the job required because there's just either so much of it or it's function, there's functional redundancy. That means that it's not that as essential. It might be important, but it doesn't mean it's essential for that function. There are going to be lots of things. So you have to be very careful about what efficacy and what degree of silencing means. People throw up numbers like, I saw 70% silencing of my gene, you know, measured by protein decrease or whatever it is. That's, it, that's meaningless unless you know how much protein you've got. We can silence, for example, one of the HSP, one of the heat shot proteins genes, we can silence that 99%. Or the 99% of the RNA to one of the HSP90 is gone, okay? 
we silenced it. There's 1% left, okay? But the thing is, is that protein, is ex that transcript is expressed at thousands of copies per cell. So even though we've now got 99% of them gone, there is still more transcript left for that than most other proteins left, most transcript, uh, protein coding transcripts in the rest of the cell. So those, you have to really think about what it is you're, you're silencing. Um, traditionally now, what's sort of developed over the years is that we're delivering either synthetic siRNAs, um, which are artificially generated. Um, so these are effectively are, are sophisticated oligonucleotides, um, which is predominantly what my labor labor laboratory uses. But you can also use express short hairpin RNAs. I, it's not that I'm, bef uh, there's no for or against camp in, in my lab. It's just that that's, we tend to do synthetic SX synthetic sRNAs to answer the questions that we're asking. There are many questions where using an shRNA is perfectly applicable. And so it's, um, it just depends on the circumstances. What is absolutely key to a good RNAi-based experiment is actually having all the assays in place to be sure that you have quantifying knockdown and looking at the right function. And that might sound stupid, but a lot of people come to me wanting to know what sRNAs or shRNAs or what things they should order before they even have an assay for their gene. And so I'm like, go away, make sure you can actually measure your gene of interest by QRT, PCR, and the model system you're going to use, and then you can buy your resources. Um, so it, really, assays come first. So I actually always say, do this and this first, and then worry about what you're going to buy. But it tends to go the other way around, in my experience. So what does an experiment in my lab look like? This is a slightly out of date, but it's perfectly applicable. And they would still look like this today. We're taking here the knockdown of a, a, a gene that many of you are going to be familiar with, uh, beta catenin involved in wind signaling. Um, and here we have two different sRNAs that are showing the decrease in beta catenin um, sig um, mRNA levels. I think this is in HCT116 cells, a, a colorectal carcinoma. So we're looking to see that we have reduced, at least by a fairly high degree, 48 hours typically um, after transfection of the siRNAs. What does it look like at a protein level? This is what we're seeing here over time. So we're looking here at 48, 72, and 96 hours. So we're looking to see what is the decrease um, over time in uh, the beta-catenin protein. And we can see how we've quantified here than the silencing um, at each time point. Um, the, viewing these time points is very useful if you do not know the stability of your protein and when you anticipate seeing functional effects. Um, so we usually do RNA at 48 hours and protein at 72 hours as our starting points and then work from there. Now, before I go into actual data and experiments, I just wanted to put out the dirty laundry of RNAi, <laughs> because you've got to be honest about this. And I realize it's a little hard to see some of this. I'll walk you through this. But this is the context of RNAi and off-target effects. And, and one of our, my collaborators, who's part of um, the TransNIH RNAi screening facility that I'll talk about, he had a very provocative title for a poster at the NIH festival last week, where it says, your sRNAs are rubbish, but I can make them better. Um, and that was because he's actually been working with our whole genome team and looking at these problems of off-target effects and was talking about how you can use bioinformatic approaches when you're looking at large data sets to address it. If you're doing bench-sized bench, um, experiments, you have to take a slightly different approach to it. But it, he got a lot of people at his poster. So I think a provocative title is always useful. So what do I mean by an off-target effect? Well, so this over here is illustrating what I showed earlier, that what we want is our sRNA to have a perfect match to its target transcript that's sequence-driven. But this is, what I didn't say earlier is, this is only 21 nucleotides. We do not have much real estate in this in terms of sequence, 21 nucleotides. And if you remember I spoke about earlier, microRNAs, actually, they only use this very first Part, there's seven or so nucleotides right at the beginning to find the sequence that it's going to match to. So when you put in an siRNA into a cell or an shRNA into a cell, that cell is not going to, doesn't know whether it's an si or a microRNA, and they do not, the cell does not care whether your experiment works or not. 
it is just going to treat it as a sequence and go and try and match it to any transcript it can match. Okay? And if you unfortunately have an eight or seven or eight nucleotides at this end of your sRNA that happens to match another transcript in such a way that risk combined, it will act like a microRNA. So you're trying to favor by design and by careful experimentation going in this direction. But event, you know, you will have the potential of seeing things going in this direction. So you have microRNA-like effects. So you, we summarized um, Scott Martin, who's a former postdoc of mine, and now actually runs the trans-NIH RNAi screen of facility and I. We sort of put this um, table together as part of a review a few years ago. It hasn't really changed in terms of how one actually attacks this problem at this point. First thing to say, people will try and sell you things that say, this solves your problem. Okay, don't, it, none of them do. None of them solve the problem. They might mitigate it a little, but they certainly don't solve it. So using pools actually makes it worse, okay? Um, some of the modifications help. Um, so you can, you have two types of, of off-target effects. You can have some that are sequence independent. I've not talked about these. This is when actually you just, you put in so much RNAi effector, the whole system gets gummed up. Um, that's really only seen in vivo um, and is not really an issue in vitro. So there have been reports when people have expressed SH, SHRNAs from AAB vectors that they've seen the whole system become totally overwhelmed. The people that do RNAi therapeutics worry about that one. Um, there are some cell lines that effectively make an immune response to um, introduction of, of nucleotides. It's, um, it's, you just want to use the lowest dose possible. So we never use any siRNA at anything over 20 nanomol. And, and so it's a very practical solution. So as a reviewer, if I see an sRNA that's used at 100 nanomolar or above, I don't even review the paper. It goes straight back because I just, it's just way too much. You, you, don't, you can't control for that. So the sequence, other sequence-dependent ones are you can have some cases of immune response. That, again, is really only worries. Uh, it's confined to very specific cell types and phenotypes, and the RNAi therapeutics people worry about that. So this is where what I'm talking about is where we have unattended targets through partial complementarity. Again, using RNA effectors at the lowest concentration um, and using very careful controls and multiple, multiple SIs or SHRNAs um, to confirm phenotype. And I'm going to describe that as I get into individual cases. So how do we use siRNA? So we the, the, the summary of how we use sRNAs is sort of here. So we use two different complementary approaches. We either um, it, do it on a screening basis where we can screen thousands if the facility can do the whole genome um, of sRNAs. We always do everything with one sRNA per well. We do not pool. And then we can assay particular phenotypes such as cell viability or reporter activity um, downstream of, of these effects in high throughput. So any assay, basically, that can be used, the cell-based assay that can be used for um, drug screening can be adapted for, for RNAi studies. The alternative um, pathway that we take or approach that we take is to actually study individual genes but in a comprehensive manner. So we might silence an individual gene and then do microarray or some other expression profiling to get a sense of what it is that I, I, um, the loss of function of that gene is asserting um, on a particular cell type. And I'm going to show examples of both of those um, now. All right. Um, so we can also adapt the whole process for doing therapeutic interventions. So instead of doing, we can add a drug. And I'm going to show you very briefly a study where we've used the, uh, a drug in addition to this. Um, and then we can also expand our endpoints here as well. We can do the same thing with microRNAs, but I'm not going to go that. So what am I going to talk about today is some actual data and some actual real-world um, studies. And this presentation is sort of part of one that I use often for presentations uh, in other scenarios. And I make the point that we're trying to, literally, we are trying to define the, the functional genome or certainly the cancer one. And that we can do this one gene at a time, but really what it comes down to is one fellow at a time. And so I'm going to talk about some work in breast cancer that was done with Stan Lipovitz. Uh, lab here at CCR, 
uh, in colorectal cancer with Thomas Reed here in the genetics branch. His lab is actually just over here. Uh, work that was started here uh, with John Weinstein. He's now at MD Anderson, and we're, we're just wrapping up now. Um, some work with my former postdoc, Scott Martin, who's now at NCATS, and then some new work that we're doing uh, with the pediatric oncology branch. And I'm just going to use these to show examples of the types of things I've talked about uh, a few minutes ago, how we use um, RNAi to um, investigate um, cancer. So I'm going to introduce this study on breast cancer. And just to give you a little bit of background, we know that this is a very heterogeneous dis uh, disease, um, that 65% of patients are, have tumors that are ER and or PR positive, so that's estrogen receptor or progesterone positive. 20% have an amplified in HER2 uh, mu or RBB2. And for these, there now are some you know, first-line targeted therapies. But 15% of cases uh, you see, are what are described as triple negative breast cancer. They do not have these markers. They do share profiles or basal epithelial cells of the breast duct and are known as basal tumors. And there's an absolute critical um, need for new molecular targeted therapies for these cancers. Predominantly in the moment, the only thing we can offer is surgery and, and cytotoxic drug treatment. So we need targeted therapies. So um, I, my group helped and worked with uh, Stan Lipovitz's group and a very talented couple of uh, fellows from that group, uh, Lindsay Murrow and, and Sarisha Garamella. And a screen was done uh, that was really focused on the human tyrosine kinomes. It was a relatively small screen, but at the time, that was what we could do. This was published now back in 2009, 2010. And what we're seeing here is actually the growth, uh, percentage growth reduction in a cell, a breast, never triple negative uh, breast cancer cell line known as MDA and B231s. We ranked everything to a, effectively a very strong positive control that we'd already defined in this cell type, which is silencing of RM2, which is one of the subunits of the ribonucleotide reductase um, gene. A protein complex that's required for DNA, uh, DNA synthesis. And I'm going to come back to that uh, a little later. And what we found was a whole series of genes that actually worked even when we silenced these in MDA and B231 cells, we saw this level of reduction in, gene, uh, in cell viability that was really quite extreme. And the top hit there was WE1. <coughs> and Stan's group went on to characterize this in a lot more detail. And what you're seeing here is, just like I showed earlier, is we have silencing of we one seen at a protein level. And what we have here is we've shown <coughs> in the, the breast cancer cell lines, we have significant reduction in cell growth, which is uh, from SI negative, which is shown here. So it's actually just only 20% of the cells left here, which in comparison with this cell line, which is a non-tumorigenic mammary epithelial cell line, um, is quite dramatic. So we still have silencing of we one here in this cell line, but there's no effect on the growth of these cells. So that suggests <coughs> that there is something that is altered in these, this, uh, the genetic, back, genetic background of these cell lines that means these cells are much more dependent on the activity of we one So you have a sense that you have some cell activity. And this was actually successfully phenocopied with a, an inhibitor to we one and it's actually being pursued actively by uh, by many groups um, that have built on this and, and similar observations. Um, so this is actually, as I say, with the drug, um, we see the same effect. This is published, so everyone's very welcome to go back to this study. I'm going to move through some of these. OK, so I'm going to move on to the next one, which is a colorectal cancer, to illustrate a different way of looking at this. So colorectal cancer is also obviously um, is a relatively well characterized change with um, cancer in that we have a fair sense of some of the genetic changes that occur over time. But there's still an under need to understand all of the functional consequences of the molecular changes that have been characterized there. <coughs> and one of the changes is illustrated here. So this is a study from uh, Geordie Camps in, in um, Thomas Reed's group. He did a couple of studies where what you're seeing here is the um, DNA copy number in colon, prim colon primary tumors, about 31 of them, where green represents a loss across the whole genome. We're going from chromosome 1 here to chromosome Y here. You see a loss is in, indicated in, in green. And then you see these blocks where you have a gain in copy number. And I want to draw your attention here 
to this particular one on chromosome 13, where there is recurrent gain in a large portion of chromosome 13, recurrently in both colon and in rectal tumors. Um, but as yet, it's been undefined what genes are on chromosome 13 that might be driving or may, as a consequence of this gain in copy number, are contributing to colorectal carcinogenesis. So I'm going to walk you through this particular slide. What started out was that the read group came to me with a list of genes that mapped to chromosome 13 that had an increase in copy number and an also an increase in gene expression. And that's sort of summarized here. This is taking out that portion of chromosome 13. So that, and that there is a correlation between amplification and gene expression. So this is the genes that have been amplified, and that most of them are overexpressed. This is in tumor samples. So what we needed to do then was get down to a curated list of candidate genes. There was 116 at that time. And we decided that the first thing to do was to PCR validate these in a whole series of cell lines. And this is shown here. So what we did was we took colorectal cancer cell lines and looked to see which of these showed a similar pa pa pattern of under an overexpression of the genes found within that region so that we could choose just one or two of these for our functional studies. And so we got down to 67 genes that looked possible, and by then going to just choose those ones that we could actually transfect at high efficiency, we got down to 44 um, in two cell lines, DLD1, which is shown on this axis, and SLB480 on this axis. And what we're looking here is at cell viability, which is an incredibly broad phenotypic effect, but tends to be the one that cancer biologists are most interested in. They really like just killing cells, which is somebody who's not trained as a cancer biologist. I'm like, well, sometimes, as you'll see, we want to do something more sophisticated. But what we're doing here is looking to see if we had a reduction in cell growth this way in both cell lines. And we found a bunch of sRNAs that seem to induce this effect. We did secondary screens that got us down to 17 genes. And then we chose from that six that looked like they were highly reproducibly, though giving very small, but were giving some effect uh, when we silenced them in um, these cell lines. But as I say, there is a problem. This is a very broad phenotype. There was huge variation between the cell lines that we analyzed. There's no control cell line. So there is no non-tumorogenic representation of colon or rectal tissue. And that's a real problem. So when you saw that previous study in breast cancer, we have a cell line that actually grows on plastic. It has, but it has a very limited number of changes. It has a P16 deletion, the MCF10A cells, but, and does not form tumors. But it's from mammary epithelium. So we can use that as a sense of whether a gene is just essential or not. So this was an issue, really, for a lot of the work we've done on this. And it also assumes single gene effects. The trouble when you're looking at a region like that that's amplified and that all these genes are overexpressed, you're trying to say that one gene out of all that 144, because this is a very large amplicon, it, are contributing. And it could be that it's two or three that are contributing. And you actually need, this is a very late event, and it's actually several of these genes. So there were some problems with this approach, but we got something out of it. What we decided to do was because only one of these genes KLF5 has ever been associated with colorectal cancer before. <clears throat> what we decided to do was take an agnostic approach and say so we're going to silence these genes in SW480 cells, one representative of colorectal cancer, and just see at a transcriptional level what happens to these it happens um, to genes where these have all been silenced. Okay. So we generated this data set, um, and this has actually just been published in Cancer Research, so for more details, I advise you look at here. But what we're trying to look at here, and I'm going to show you one here on a larger scale. This is taking LNX2, which is shown here. And what you see here is what we've, we've silenced LNX2 with two different sRNAs and then done expression profiling 72 hours later. And we see these are the genes that are deregulated by both siRNAs. And we see very high correlations for those, those so we can pick out the genes that look like they're truly being deregulated following LNX2 silencing. And we can eliminate the minimal potential off-target effects that we might be seeing. So it's a very practical way of, of looking in an unbiased manner what is happening to these cells. And what you can see, oops, 
in red here are the two probes corresponding to LX2. So this is down-regulating LX2. And then we're interested in seeing what's here and what's here. And we did this for all of these genes, but I'm going to focus on the LNX2 story here. So what we found, and this is a more traditional representation of the data that you're used to, of seeing a heat map showing 337 genes that are down-regulated, 343 genes that are up-regulated following, following um, silencing of LNX2. And the question is, what is this telling us? Well, it helps, first of all, if you know what, LNA, what we do know about LNX2. So it's known as the ligand of non-protein X2, and it's thought to serve as a scaffold for the membrane protein NUM. That was originally identified, NUM was originally identified as involved in sulfate as part of the notch signaling um, pathway. And it's known that the notch signaling pathway is altered in colorectal cancer. So this seemed like a really good candidate for us to extend, uh, study more detail. But it had not been previously linked to colorectal cancer. So can we see a link to notch signaling in our um, study? So here we're seeing what we're looking for. So we know LNX2 is supposed to interact with NUM. That's supposed to affect notch signaling. So we would anticipate that we should see changes in downstream markers of notch signaling. And if we do look at our um, data from our expression profiling, we actually find that all of these major changes, here's the decrease in notch 1. We see no changes in none, but we do see changes in notch 1 and in their downstream targets, so HES6, HE2, and LFNG. So this indicates that, yes, when we're silencing LNX2, this is affecting notch signaling, and we see these downstream effects. This is confirmed here at a protein level. Well, what else can we get out of this? So what we did was a, a um, postdoc student in my lab who's now at, at the University of Chicago. He created curated lists of known or established um, transcription factors that we know are deregulated in colorectal cancer and curated the list of targets that have been established for them. And then looked to see if there was enrichment for any particular um, downstream targets of any of these colorectal cancer-associated transcription factors. And I'm going to draw your attention to this one here. So this is the data for LNX2, and what we're looking here is an enrichment value based on a p-value. So we're looking to see, are the targets of these transcription factors altered when we silence LNX2? And if you see in green, we see here there's this huge enrichment for the down-regulated targets of this gene TC, or this protein, I should say, this transcription factor, TCF7L2. So these are deregulated following silencing of LNX2. So why do we care about that? Well, TCF7L2 is a major effector of Wnt, uh, I should say, Wnt beta catenin Wnt signaling. This can get altered down there. I'm sorry. Um, and so uh, it's well established that this is a signaling pathway that is significantly deregulated in colorectal cancer. So we were very interested in this observation. So we looked at this in more detail, and indeed we do see that when we silence LNX2, so here we've got silencing LNX2, we see complete uh, ablation of TCF7L2 protein levels. We see that we can alter significantly a reporter assay of wind signaling. This is the uh, known as the top flash assay. And all I want to draw your attention is that we see this huge de decrease um, in um, that assay system. More importantly, we could go back to the tumor samples. We actually did this with multiple public data sets and said if we take the genes that we, we found that are regulated by LNX2 using our gene expression um, data, so that are known targets of TC7L2, can we use that to distinguish colorectal tumors and, and adjacent mucosa? And that indeed is the case. So this expression module very clearly shows that there's a difference for this module that's been generated from our data between tumor and mucosa. So this really said to us that there is a link through LNX2 to two major pathways deregulated in colorectal cancer, and that the, up the amplification and upregulation of this gene in tumors may be affecting the actual outcome um, of may be influencing the biology uh, underlying this cancer. So 
that was colorectal cancer where we have an amplification of a gene. We can also just do it, see this when we actually just look at overexpression. And if you remember, I'm sure you've been a, a, have observed, there have been a lot of studies that have been published, huge numbers of studies that have profiled the overexpression of genes in different tumors and said this this is, if we target this, we'll be able to, to treat um, these tumors. And this is a case of that where you see, well, coming back to a gene I mentioned earlier, RM2. This <clears throat> RM2, as I say, is part of the ribonucleotide reductase um, complex. It's absolutely essential for production of DNTPs and therefore is required for replication DNA repair. And so what we saw here is that it consistently upregulated in tumors. In a, this is the upregulation in rectal cancer, upregulation in colon cancer. This is in cell lines. There's a heat map, so red means overexpression. That's in 25 lines. And that's, it's, it's very straightforward. These cells require more DNTP, so they upregulate RM2 to do it. And it's been long known that RM2 would make a fabulous clinical target because cells do seem to be, that cancer cells do seem to be professional, prof, preferentially dependent on its activity. You're going to see some effect in normal cells, but you may be able to find a sweet spot if you could target it more effectively. There are very few drugs. There's no specific drugs for it. Gencytamine has an effect on RM, both RM1 and RM2, but it's an indirect effect. Okay. So <clears throat> we're showing here that if you silence RM2, you see this is the reduction in RNA levels as percentage of control, and that we see this change in cell viability over time. So as I say, RM2 is part of the ribonucleotide reductase complex, um, and this is summarized here. And it's not just been an, because it's an anti-cancer target, but it's also been considered an antiviral target. Uh, we know that cisplatin has some effects on RM1, gencytopine on RM1, and then RM2, gemcitabine probably has some effect on RM2, as does hydroxy a year. And there's also been development of anti-sense technology for this. And I'm going to come back to that nucleic, nucleic acid targeting of this in a moment. So we did exactly the same as I described just a moment ago for LNX2. We came up with a um, <coughs> inhibition. We got a profile of what occurs in these cells following knockdown of RM2 to get a sense of what was happening. Because though they say there have been attempts to try and inhibit RM2 with drugs, they're very unclean. You know, they, they, they do lots of things. This was a way of us contributing to the community exactly what should happen when you silence RM2. And from that, we can actually get a sense of what is occurring when we silence RM2. And I'll just, uh, again, this is published work, and you get a sense that we're changing, particularly here, a lot of genes associated with uh, or proteins that are connecting RAM pathways around. Uh, the cyclins, which you would expect in a cell cycle, uh, including mitotic-associated um, uh, genes such as uh, PLK1. But the key thing was, was this actually contributes to a field that is ongoing, and I wanted to highlight this translational implications of the work that we do and, and others in this field, in that can RM2 be silenced in vivo? As I say, this has been a target for decades that people have been trying to, to, to attack. And I just want to highlight this paper that came out in 2010 and work on this is continuing where uh, from Mark Davis's lab at Caltech where they took nanoparticles that incorporated an siRNA and this was an siRNA that was designed against RM2 um, and so it was put into a sophisticated um, nanoparticle and then was delivered to patients with melanoma and what you have here is the data for three different patients uh, actually, no, this is, this is two patients. They did three in total. And what they were looking for, <coughs> excuse me, here was a decrease in RM2, mRNA levels, pre and post um, administration of the nanoparticle containing RM2. There's, and then you had it even better in the second patient. This was actually the third patient where they did, so there was, it was A and B where they just have mRNA. Here they have mRNA and protein. Um, and so this showed that actually in vivo they could get generation of a knockdown. So this is in the malignant melanoma patients themselves. Oh, I don't know if it works. Sorry about this. Um, they were able to get um, what you're looking here is RM2 staining. 
So a protein in patient C, this is the antibody to RM2, and post you can see significant reduction in um, antibody. Now what they used for this delivery for this nanoparticle was a transferrin uh, receptor, and so you were actually, were actually showing that these had been uptake, uh, there was uptake here as a consequence of um, targeting to the trans transferrin receptor. Now, there are number, lots of groups that are working on RNAi therapeutic approaches. I'm not going to go into detail here. This is actually an, another study more recently. Uh, it was published in Cell in 2012, um, where they used different ways of changing the sRNA to make it more deliverable. This was targeting P10 in the liver um, and looking for reduction over time. It comes back, but you've got silencing of P10 for quite some time in these, and this is its addition uh, by um, sub-Q and then also by IV, so systemic delivery. So lots of people are working on trying to deliver um, sRNA or even microRNAs now um, as a therapeutic approach. So I just wanted to touch on here at that point before returning to some other work. So I just want to run through a couple of things um, towards the end, um, which is trying to take this where we, most of what we've done in the therapeutic field is to use sRNAs, use RNAi to actually just make the drugs we have now better or better understand them. So this is where we're combining um, either, it, usually in RNAi screening and then in, in down to analysis, we take silencing of genes over a period of time and then adding in a therapeutic intervention and seeing how that compares. So I'm going to talk about two stories. One is looking at uh, bacterially derived or an enzymatic drug known as allosparaginase, and the other one is the DNA damaging agent camptothecan. So the ba reason for doing this is sort of outlined here. We want to use this so that we can um, perhaps find better ways of um, looking at complementary vulnerabilities of cells by doing, sister doing um, synergistic um, targeting. So I don't it's, it, I've been shocked, and I don't have exact numbers, but I am told by very, very uh, reliable sources that the amount of cost for trials trying to figure out combinations that we should put together in individuals is absolutely phenomenal. Because we know that almost, no cancer patient will get one drug. They're going to get multiple ones, and we have to know what combination. And as we go into this area of personalized medicine or precision medicine or whatever you want to call it, that's going to become more and more important because resistance is a major issue in that context. So we're going to need to knock down just one pathway but multiple pathways. We need to do them all together. But testing that is really difficult. There are ways that people are trying to do that by just testing matrices of compounds. We're trying to do it from an RNII point of view by just seeing if we knock down two different we take out, use a drug, and then we knock out a gene. Can we just make those better and, and give us a sense of where we should start? Another important facet is that you can often use lower concentrations of two drugs together in that way, and that can be very useful. That has the potential we can overcome uh, drug resistance or overcome um, side effects, um, uh, the burden of using very high levels of drug. That's particularly relevant, for example, for the work we were doing on camptothecan then uh, there's broadening the clinical application to other cancer types. And the first vignette, first story I'm going to talk about is a, is a sort of a case of that. So this study um, was actually been published a while ago, but I still like to tell this story because I think it's really cool, <laughs> frankly. And it was one of the first ones I did when I moved to NCI, and so it's going to be close to my heart for many years, I think. So it, the, the, the work came out of an observation that John Weinstein had made that he saw a strong correlation in one subset of the NCI-60 cell lines that are used for screening um, at the NCI of drugs. He saw a strong correlation between the sensitivity of cells to this drug, allosparaginase or LS, and the expression of this gene, ASNS. So this is actually showing with different parameters and tell how old they are because they're now, you know, early cDNAs and affymetrics and, and very early CGH. But whatever thing he looked at, he saw this correlation between this drug and this gene. And so 
What is L-asparaginase? It's actually been an FDA-approved drug for more than 30 years for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And what it does is it depletes the blood levels of this non-essential amino acid asparagine. Um, and it does that by hydrolyzing serum asparagine to ammonia and aspartic acid. Aspartic acid and that affects tumor growth. And that's sort of represented here. Um, and so it's a very simple way of doing it. Now, L-asparaginase is now available as recombinant, and there are lots of different groups affecting it. Um, but what we wanted to do was ask was, asparagine is a non-essential amino acid because we have the asparagine synthetase gene. And this catalyzes the conversion of aspartate in the presence of glutamine and ATP to asparagine. So what we wanted to do was look at, is there an effect of how much asparagine synthetase you have and how you respond to ALL, and respond to L-asparaginase. And we actually ended up doing the context of ovarian cancer because that's where we'd seen the original relationship, and we could do the experiments there much easier than in ALL cell lines. So I'm going to run through a few slides where I show you functionally how we did this in the lab. So what we're seeing here is the silencing of asparagine synthesis mRNA after 48 hours in three different cell lines that have different levels of asparagine synthetase. This is the levels of asparagine synthetase here on a log two scale. This is their sensitivity to L-asparaginase down here. So asparagine synthetase here, L-asparaginase here. And then we see knockdown at 48 in all three cell lines. So this is what you want as a perfect basis for your experiment. We confirm this at a protein level. So this is just plotting here the amount of protein over time. And this is a very nice example of what happens over time in an sRNA-based experiment in the lab. So the protein will deplete after about f uh, over five days and then will return as the cells divide. But we have sufficient window here to do our drug analysis. So after 48 hours or seven, yeah, after 48 hours, we added our drug asparaginase and then looked to see what happened 48 or 72 hours later using an MTS assay, so using an assay of cell viability. And what we see here is that in the OVCAR4 cells, we see a five-fold potentiation of the sig signal when we silence asparagine synthetase. We see the same thing in OVCAR3s. And then in the cell line that expresses already very low levels of asparagine synthetase, what lit but if we take away whatever else there is, we now get a 500-fold potentiation of this drug. So this is really quite you know, a, a phenomenal effect. So what we now know is that what we're able to do is actually that when L asparaginase is actually added to cells, it actually upregulates the asparagine synthetase gene. In those cells that don't have it very much, that's attenuated. And by silencing it, we attenuate it even further. So by inhibiting the induction of ASNS with the siRNA, we're doing, we're doing, we get a double whammy. We can both not just knock it down, but we suppress that upregulation and that we've been uh, working for the last few years really trying to figure out that mechanism. And that will hopefully be, be wrapped up soon. And there's actually an NCI pattern on this position that links these two so that ASNS levels could be used as a biomarker. I'm going to finish off talking about campesicum, which is a DNA damaging agent that works by um, inhibiting the ability of cells to re-ligate after, um, after replication um, and through the formation of, of double-stranded uh, double DNA breaks. And so what we did was a, a study, and I'm going to skip through this one at time. What we did was an RNI, sorry about this, I'm going to do an RNA, we did an RNAi screen to look for genes that potentiated the effect of this uh, drug. So things that we knew, so CPT and its clinical analogs have to be used at relatively high doses. There's um, dose-limiting toxicity. So we want to find an agent that we can, in something else we can inhibit and combine with it to, to lower the dose that we will use it. So what we found is this one protein that when we silence MAP3K7, we significantly potentiated cells to, uh, in, in, in enhance the cytotoxicity of CPT. So here we have the, uh, a representation of the screening data using when no CPT is added. So there's no effect when we silence this gene alone. But when we add CPT, we see a very significant change in its, um, the Z-score, the transform Z-score, uh, when we silence MAP3K7. So what is this protein, or what uh, protein does MAP3K7 um, encode? 
it encodes TAC1, which is downstream of the TGF beta um, receptor uh, through the TRAF6. It also interacts through other uh, signals, but this seems to be the predominant one that we were interested in at this point. And what it's known is that it's part of the NF kappa B signal. And what is interesting is it's known that CPT, when it induces damage, it actually triggers NF kappa B, and that actually that suppresses um, that in, it, it, it will attempt to suppress apoptosis. It actually induces anti-apoptic genes and actually suppresses apoptosis. So actually, cells that express CPT they are dying through non-apoptotic pathways. It's through ga gamma H2X, uh, through um, non-apoptotic driven um, cell death. What we're speculating is, is that by silencing TAC1, we're able to stop this response and you get both apoptosis, you're driving more apoptosis uh, because you're not blocking it through activation of NF kappa B. And we were able to actually show now that we can actually target both an upstream um, protein of TAC1, TRAF6, and we can, its binding partner, TAB2, and get the same effect. And in fact, we see that these also sensitize cells to doxorubicin as well. So this is probably a fairly broad um, synergism with DNA damage. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to move to very large screening. I've just tried to highlight various features of how we use RNAi to address the sort of issues people are using uh, that are, we want to address in uh, translational cancer biology. But we really want to get big. So what I've talked about has been stuff that's been done on a relatively small scale. But we can now go to whole genome scale. And back in late 2010, um, at, we had developed a um, collaborative trans-NIH RNI screening facility that's actually now part of NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. It's based out in Shady Grove. And what they're able to do, um, because they have a robotic setup, um, is that they can do very large screening uh, projects. Um, the joke, though, is it, well, it's not a joke, it, it, it takes about six months to be able to probably get onto this machine. It takes the machine a week to do the whole genome, and then you'll spend about two years trying to figure out what it all means. So this bit's actually now working really well. Getting into it and getting out of it is the hard bit. Okay, and I'm going to describe some of that. We've had to develop very sophisticated, or the team has developed very sophisticated software to be able to analyze this data. And this is <coughs> an extension of the screen I just described, which is why I wanted to describe this one and not the other project, um, is where we took, as one of our pilot studies, we did the same um, screen that we've done on a small scale, but now did it on the machine, looking at over 100,000 wells, 100,000 data points, with no CPT, uh, a, an EC10 of CPT and an EC30 of CPT, and, and looked to see what we could get out of this, and we got this, and we were really pleased that MAP3K7 was back as one of our top hits, even when you go out to now the whole druggable genome. But we got a whole bunch of other things from the NF kappa B um, pathway as well, as well as known DNA damage and, and other genes that you would expect to be there. And Eve Pommier is following up on that from CCR. The last minute, I'm just going to go to really big scale. And this is talking about a project that I'm currently involved in, which is a massive collaboration with the Pediatric Oncology branch and the NCATS facility, and also with Patrick Gora at Vanderbilt, who started this work in. Um, and it's looking at trying to do uh, our whole genome screens to look at activity of a, um, in, to better understand the mechanism behind Ewing sarcoma. This is a highly aggressive malignant bone tumor of childhood. Um, and it has a very classical um, genetic hallmark. I mean, the 85% of cases are associated with a translocation that generates an oncogenic transcription factor known as e EWS fly one. So this is the initiating genetic event in these tumors. It's necessary for malignant transformation, but it's not sufficient. So there are many downstream things that have to occur. But you, what you end up with is a transcription factor that has the five prime end of the EWS gene, uh, which has a transactivating domain. And then we have a three prime terminus of fly one, which has a DNA binding domain. So it acts as an aberrant transcription factor, both activating and repressing whole sets of genes. So we know that if you inhibit this um, fusion by sRNA or antisense, you can um, significantly reduce um, cell proliferation in vitro and in mice. But it's considered undruggable because it's a transcription factor. 
So we need a better way to understand the biology to hopefully find better things that we can target and, and that could be turned into a more suitable druggable target. Okay? So we've now conducted a whole genome screen using a reporter assay uh, that was originally di uh, developed for, for a drug screen. Um, this corresponds to data from 142, it's 143,000 um, data points. And from this, we can figure out what it looks like is specifically modulating the expression of the EWS fly one. And I'm just going to show you this here. This is actually looking at the entire screen where we look at the difference between the two different reporter assays and get a sense of what is selectively altering this response. And we fortunately got the sRNAs to EWSR1 and FLY1 that are part of the fusion. They fell out nicely out of the screen. But we've got still about 200 other genes in follow-up. This is just showing the 43. And this is proving a very hard phase <laughs> to work our way through these. But most of them, I think, are going to prove to be, um, be accurate. So I've taken you through a very rushed journey um, because I wanted to give aspects to you all of all the types of things that people are using RNII for in a translational setting. Clearly, this is also a very important basic research um, uh, uh, mechanism that people are studying in that context. But I think others will be uh, talking about that in a moment. And as you can imagine, this is a, I've had huge numbers of collaborators over the last few years at CCR. And I highlighted, I hope, most of the people that we've worked with as we've gone through this. Um, but I'm just going to particularly highlight from my lab, Scott Martin and, and Jason Pitt, because I discussed a lot of the work that they, they did. Thank you. So what that's had to be built into the analysis steps. So Gene Bueller was actually recruited from Merck and does that. He's developed a couple of different algorithmic approaches that allows us to find us all the seed sequences that, my, that, they, that the sRNAs could be producing. And we put that into the analysis up front. So I would say that on the whole, most the problem is the bandwidth of the numbers of hits that we get is such that I really can't answer your question. Because what we, we can't, when we go back to CCR investigators, or Scott goes back to CCR investigators, or across the whole NIH, because this is trans-NIH, we go back with the list of genes to do. People pick two or three. So I actually can't answer your question. Um, I would say that it is, it's pretty high, the success. Right, we do secondary screens with additional sRNAs. We do all those steps, but actually, the bottom line is there's just not the bandwidth to do everything. So we don't really know. Okay, our next speaker is Enrique Zudare. He got his PhD in Spain. And uh, currently, he's with the Mouse Cancer Genetics Program up at NCI Frederick. He's in the tumor angiogenesis section. His title is Angiogenesis in Cancer, New Opportunities for Therapeutic Intervention. Kiki. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much. Um, 
So yeah, my name is Enrique Sederi. I'm at the Tumor Energy Genesis section. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about um, tumor angiogenesis uh, for the next, hopefully, 45 minutes. Uh, thank you for staying here. It's very cold outside, so you might as well enjoy the warmth of the, uh, of the room. Um, so I, I would like to begin to um, uh, my presentation by defining what angiogenesis is. And uh, I use, you know, often this slide that, that um, compares two uh, processes that are related but uh, that are different. Um, uh, one is angiogenesis, the other one is vasculogenesis. So angiogenesis is the formation of vasculature from pre-existing vessels. And, um, and I have a little um, video in here which uh, demonstrate that. This is from a, from a uh, publication. Um, uh, some studies done in, in zebrafish. Here you can see a vessel, and you can see how you know additional vessels actually grow uh, during embryo uh, development of the, uh, of the fish. So this is what we call angiogenesis. Uh, a, a different process is vasculogenesis, which is also the formation of vasculature, but in this case from um, undifferentiated um, angioblasts. And, and both of these processes are very um, important, very prominent during uh, embryo development. Um, Angiogenesis also occurs in adult um, organisms. Uh, there are scarce, scarce uh, um, reports of vasculogenesis in, uh, occurring also in adults, um, but it's not as prominent as, as angiogenesis is. So formation of vasculature from, from pre-existing um, vessels. So angiogenesis is, I like always to talk about, you know, physiological and pathological angiogenesis. And obviously angiogenesis, I don't know if this is obvious for you or not, but um, uh, uh, angiogenesis is a very important process, physiologically speaking. Not only during embryo development, but um, through a number of different processes, some of which are detailed here. Um, uh, you know, female reproduction system, corpus, uh, luteum formation, uh, wound healing, for instance, is extremely important for wound healing. Wound healing is a very uh, angiogenesis dependent process. And then we also have pathological angiogenesis. So as we're going to uh, uh, talk about later, angiogenesis is a very tightly regulated process. And when this process is deregulated or becomes deregulated, it is normally associated with a disease state. And so we can have too much angiogenesis or we can have too little angiogenesis. And, that, and both of those you know, become pathological um, uh, situations. So in some cases, um, um, we want to stimulate angiogenesis. For instance, we have a heart attack, and in the recovery of the heart attack or in a wound healing, for instance, we want to induce angiogenesis since these processes are angiogenesis dependent. Uh, in other cases, we have too much angiogenesis, and, and the goal, the therapeutic goal, will be to block, to be able to block angiogenesis. So uh, there is a number of these diseases, you know, like for instance, hemangioma, psoriasis, and most, most notably uh, 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 tumor growth and metastasis, which are related with angiogenesis. And that, as we're going to see uh, later, uh, there is. In, in 1971, actually, Judah Falkman put forward a hypothesis that if we were able to block angiogenesis, to control angiogenesis, we'll be able to retard or delay uh, tumor growth. Um, this is a very simplified story of tumor progression. Okay, Here we have our happy uh, normal cell that, for reasons that we're going to discuss, we're not going to discuss now, becomes a tumor cell. This tumor cell is fully tumorgenic. In the right context, it could become a clinically relevant uh, tumor. However, it needs to go through a, a series of uh, uh, steps. Um, during the initiation and promotion, this cell divides, and it reaches a certain size. That size of a tumor is what we call dormant in situ cancer, dormant tumors. Um, I like to cite this, this seminal publication from Black and Welch in, uh, in 1993. And actually, the publication, the focus of the publication was not gonna, what I'm going to describe now, but it's mentioned in that publication. These two uh, doctors that were looking at trauma patients for small lesions, um, you know, malignant uh, lesions. And what they found was 
uh, um, I think, surprising. And is that, for instance, age 40 to 50, 39% of women present these lesions in the breast. Um, age 60 to 70, 46% of males present these lesions in the prostate. However, et cetera. However, only about 1% of these lesions are ever diagnosed, meaning 1% of these people go to the doctor saying, I have a cancer. Okay? So what this means is that you know, all these 38% remaining, those cancers, they never developed. Those cancers are there, but they actually never evolve into a clinically relevant um, entity, which I guess is a, a good thing. So these numbers, that there is now a number of publications that have supported uh, the same observation, and these numbers are actually going down, and these numbers are going up, meaning this is a normal thing. We all have these things, at least when we reach a certain, uh, a certain age. So, so there is then a um, um, data to support uh, these dormant in situ cancers, which are, again, fully tumorigenic um, um, cells that could develop into tumors, but they don't. Actually, th there are some interesting studies that they take these lesions and they put them in a different environment, and then these lesions are able to grow into clinically relevant um, uh, tumors. So what does these tumor mass need to, in order to grow into a, a, a tumor? Well, there is a number of um, uh, characteristics within the tumor microenvironment in these particular lesions that allow those cells to be able to recruit vessels to induce angiogenesis, what we call angiogenesis. So, uh, there are a number of different st stimulus that, that can occur in the, in the tumor microenvironment. One of them is hypoxia. These cells, when they reach a certain size, because they are not vascularized, there is no oxygen reaching these cells, they become hypoxic. And hypoxia is a powerful um, uh, stimulus for angiogenesis. So there is a crosstalk that occurs between the tumor cells and the endothelial cells in nearby uh, vessels which results in induction of angiogenesis and a sprouting of vessels from these vessels toward um, uh, the tumor cells. So this is how angiogenesis occurs. And it's at that point, once the tumor gets vascularized, that it can reach, that it can you know, uh, grow exponentially and reach uh, a clinically uh, relevant size. And metastasize. Um, I want to emphasize, uh, I mentioned before, I just mentioned tumor microenvironment. So this is not only a game between the tumor cells and, in the, and the endothelial cells. Within the tumor microenvironment, there is a number of different uh, cell types and um, both cellular and extracellular um, um, uh, elements that participate uh, during the angiogenesis uh, uh, process and that are going to be important. And I think I'm going to be mentioning um, a little more about this in a minute. So, as I said before, angiogenesis is very tightly regulated. Under normal conditions, there are stimulators of angiogenesis and inhibitors of angiogenesis that are balanced. Um, and angiogenesis is controlled. Um, for instance, my four-year-old daughter in the summer, she has a constant scabs in her knees, right? So it's like a constant wound. So thank you for angiogenesis, a dysregulated process that allows you know, these, these knees to, to heal constantly during, uh, during the summer. So perfect balance between these stimulators and inhibitors of angiogenesis. Um, those in situ tumors that we were talking about before that don't develop, uh, something like that occurs as well. There is kind of like a balance between proangiogenic and antiangiogenic factors, and the tumor stays at, a, at that particular size. If there is an imbalance in these factors, either too, ma too much stimulators or too few inhibitors, then is when angiogenesis occurs, and then is within the tumor microenvironment when these cells you know, uh, uh, can grow to um, clinically relevant um, tumor. Um, I like this slide because it's also, it, it also mentions some of the other uh, players within the tumor microenvironment. There is a whole slag of inflammatory cells which are recruited to the tumor site and that participate in the tumor angiogenesis process. Um, there is endothelium, of course, of, uh, from the vessels. There is fibroblast. 
Um, there are uh, T cells, trauma. So there is a lot of different components within the tumor microenvironment which are important, not just the tumor cells or um, the endothelial cells. And uh, this is just a representation of that idea that we, uh, in a study that we did a number of years ago, where we looked at the influence of certain uh, inflammatory cells within the tumor microenvironment. So this is summarized basically in this slide where we have the tumor cells, which because of the distance from this vessel over here, um, they are in a hypoxic environment. And that induces or that allows the tumor cells to secrete, to produce and secrete a number of factors which are angiogenesis stimulators. These angiogenesis stimulators create a gradient towards uh, um, uh, this pre-existing vessel and induce the um, migration of inflammatory cells to the tumor microenvironment where they can actually release additional factors which are proangiogenic factors and then is when uh, these angiogenesis process is enhanced not only by the tumor cells but all of, you know, all of these components within the, within the, um, the tumor microenvironment. Um, these vessels uh, that reach the tumor, these tumor vessels basically, are different than the norm normal vessels. And um, this is, for instance, a case, um, um, I wanted to show this because it's, um, it illustrates very well, you know, how the, uh, the vasculature invades the tumor. This is a case of a 14-year-old with a large pheochromocytoma right here. This is a kidney, kidney, backbone, ribs. And the pheochromocytoma is here, which I have digitally extracted so you can look at the, uh, at the vessels. And you can see how all these vessels are invading all these is um, uh, neovessels, neovasculature. That vasculature was not there before. So it's grown towards the tumor, it's invading um, the tumor, which in this case is very involved. And, um, but one of the things that, that, that you already see here is not only that the tumor has a lot of vessels, but that these vessels look different than the normal vessels, like these vessels over here. So one of the things that you, that you can observe already is that they are very tortuous. They're not as straight, you know, nice as straight vessels, but they're very tortuous vessels. So this is something that is, uh, uh, that is being studied. And um, uh, indeed, uh, you know, normal vasculature, normal vessels, uh, they have a nice pericyte coverage. I'm not sure you're familiar with, with these cells, pericytes, but pericytes cover uh, vessels, cover the endothelial cells in the vessels and stabilize um, uh, vessels. They have, for instance, a reduced integrating uh, expression. They are very tight. Normal vessels are not leaky. We're not losing blood, you know, all over our, our body. They're really tight um, uh, vessels. And this is in contrast to uh, tumor vessels, which are very tortuous, you know. They, the morphology of those vessels is different. Uh, they've lost co um, uh, pericyte coverage, and therefore, they are very leaky. Tumor cells are very leaky. Um, interestingly, and this is something that I'll talk about later, they also express markers that are not expressed in the normal vasculature. And this is, and this is what, uh, what they're called tumor endothelial markers and is um, the main subject of study in our, um, in our group. But you can already understand that if these vessels, these tumor endothelial um, uh, cells express tumor endothelial markers, meaning markers that are not expressed in the tumor vasculature, we have a mean to differentiate those vessels and we have a way to develop therapeutics that are able to target specifically um, those vessels. Uh, just an example of uh, um, how these vessels look like. Here, for instance, you have normal vessels and here you have tumor vessels already, you know, uh, uh, very easy to differentiate um, just by the morphology of these vessels. Another example using a scanning electron microscope, um, a striking differences between the normal vessels over here and the, and the tumor vessels. And just a representation of how, you know, leaky these vessels are. Um, some of these tumors actually are, are full with blood. Uh, they form these blood lakes, and it's just because the vessels are extremely leaky and they continuously, you know, uh, leak um, blood to the extracellular medium. Um, 
So based on this, as I mentioned before, Judah Falkman in 1971 in this paper in a, a, a New England Journal of Medicine proposed that if two things. One, that tumor growth is dependent on angiogenesis, and two, if we can actually therapeutically target this vasculature, we'll be able to delay tumor growth. Um, so this happened in 1971, so it's been like 42 years until today. So there's been, uh, we're pretty much going to skip those 42 years, but I'm going to tell you that yes, there's been uh, a lot of efforts to develop um, anti-angenic therapeutics, and uh, is one of the most promising actually uh, uh, fields in, in oncology. And so can we cure cancer with anti-angenic therapy? So I guess the answer is yes, and this was demonstrated in as early as 1997. And in this uh, publication in Judah Falkman's lab, uh, what they show in different tumors is with this particular um, um, anti-angiogenic uh, uh, compound, they can grow tumors. And they, when they start administering the anti-angenic compound, the tumor regresses. When they stop adding the, the anti, uh, administering the anti-angenic compound, the tumor uh, starts growing again. They administer it back, and they can go cycles, you know, of giving the anti-angenic compound or uh, giving some vacation uh, uh, period, basically, between the two. And you can see how the, the, the um, uh, tumor growth goes up and down. And they were able to show this in, in a lot of different uh, tumor types, uh, demonstrating that the tumor growth is very much dependent on angiogenesis. And if you block angiogenesis, basically, you uh, are able to block uh, tumor growth and regress um, uh, the tumor. Now, these, these are um, xenograph models. These are mice. And when you know, people ask Judah Foreman, can you cure cancer with anti-angiogenic therapy? And he said, sure, in mice. I can cure them in mice. A completely different story is what happens in humans, right? And when we try to translate all this into the clinic. And this is one of the things that I want to talk about. And I have a number of slides uh, um, that will um, illustrate you know, the problems or the challenges, basically, of translating this uh, particular um, anti-angiogenic therapeutics into the clinic. As a matter of fact, this one, endostatin, is one of the therapeutics that fail, basically, in the clinic, even though results in preclinical models were so um, striking. Oh, this is, uh, the, the, you had to read the paper. This is how, basically, they've done the, the studies and they did so this continuous administration of the drug at that point. OK, so as I mentioned before, there's been um, uh, a tremendous effort to develop uh, therapeutics targeting proangiogenic um, uh, compounds. And this is just a um, summary, a, a temporal line, basically, of all those you know, um, anti-angiogenic um, therapeutics that, that have been targeted. And it's not comprehensive. There are more than the ones that are, that are shown in here. And um, uh, these therapeutics actually cover a whole spectrum of different molecules and factors within the cell, addition, mole uh, addition molecules. Uh, endogenous inhibitors, angiogenic factors, protease inhibitors. So there's a lot, lot basically, of different um, types of factors that can be targeted and that have a, an, an anti-angiogenic uh, effect. And it's also worth mentioning that pharma is quite interested in this field. And so they invest heavily in, in anti-angiogenic um, um, research, which is a good thing, actually, um, for the patient eventually. Um, so there's a number of different pathways, as I was saying in, this, in the uh, previous slide, that can be targeted um, uh, in order to target angiogenesis. One of the things that I haven't mentioned um, in the interest of uh, time is that angiogenesis is quite a complex process uh, that can be seen as an as a orderly um, um, series of steps that are required, basically, to uh, from the moment where endothelial cells get activated, they start proliferating. They need to move around within the, uh, within the tumor microenvironment. They need to align, the, align themselves, interact with each other to form a tube. So it's quite a, it's, it's quite a complex process. And from uh, the perspective of, of people like me that try to block these, uh, this process, all of those steps 
uh, represent a, an opportunity to block angiogenesis. All of those steps are required, and therefore all of them, you know, are an opportunity to, to block angiogenesis. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of different targets that can be used. Um, uh, this is a summary of FDA-approved anti-angiogenic therapeutics. And um, let me see. Yeah, it's, it's actually not up to date, but it's, pretty, but it, but it's a pretty good summary. Um, and the one thing that I want to um, highlight here is that even though there is a lot of different pathways that can be targeted, most of the efforts up, you know, to today um, have been focused on this particular molecule in here, which is called vascular endothelial growth factor. It's one of the earliest um, uh, pro-angiogenic factors discovered. It's produced by tumor cells and other uh, cells as well. And there are a lot of different uh, of these compounds that target um, vascular endothelial growth factor, either in a direct manner or in an indirect manner. Um, here is endostatin bevacizumab. Is this um, um, therapeutic, or I've asked him, you've probably heard of, of this one before. It's a monoclonal antibody that targets vascular endothelial growth factor. And this is a multi-billion dollar drug that, uh, you know, has, um, uh, was the first FDA-approved antiangiogenic um, therapeutic and was um, basically um, the therapeutic that proved that antiangiogenic therapy would, uh, could be useful in the clinic. Um, but again, a lot of the efforts uh, currently, uh, uh, and, uh, which are currently undergoing, are focused on vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, I was just curious, and I did a, a search in PubMed about um, angiogenesis papers in general and, and how many of those papers are focused on VEGF. So it turns out that um, angiogenesis papers keep increasing. This is the last one for last year, 2012, and we're reaching like 1,400 a year. And from all those, about 50% of those papers are dedicated to VEGF, to vascular endothelial, uh, 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 VEGF. And if you put all of the other angiogenesis compounds combined, they're in about 10% you know, of, of the papers. So again, this is, um, um, uh, and that's why I put here diversity. There is kind of like a lack of diversity in the angiogenesis field. There is a lot of people focused on vascular endothelial growth factor. And um, in my opinion, there are a lot of opportunity, therapeutic opportunities that uh, need to be explored, which will be down here on this, um, on this graph. Um, does anti-VEGF therapy works? And the answer is yes, at least in preclinical models and also in, in the clinic, as I'll, as I'll show before, uh, after. But um, so this is just an example. This is a, a, an HM7, human colon cancer. Um, prior uh, uh, treatment with anti-VEGF therapeutics and after 48 hours after. So as you can see, 48 hours, this antibody requires 48 hours and pretty much like 90% of the, box, the vasculature is gone. Okay, and the tumor is already regressing significantly. So yes, it does work in preclinical models and we use it all the time and it consistently uh, works very well to block tumor growth. Um, some examples of those um, therapeutics that I showed before. This is uh, Avastin is not the only one. There are other um, um, therapeutics, basically, or drugs that target um, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. So what happens in the clinic? And I already uh, was telling you before that there are numerous challenges, actually, to translate what we see in preclinical models into the clinic. So these are some of the successful phase three clinical trials uh, with some of those drugs that I showed you in, in the previous slide. So there are a lot of them done with bevacizumab, uh, either alone or in combination with all kinds of different chemotherapeutics. And um, as you can see, there is a number of uh, clinical trials where there is a benefit in uh, progression of free survi uh, survival, but not in overall survival. So the take on message for all this slide is, yes, it helps sometimes in progression of free survival, but in a lot of cases, we, we don't see um, overall survival. The other um, um, uh, uh, issue that is worth mentioning here is that the benefit achieved with Avastin or Vevacizumab so far is often measured in weeks or in months, two months, three months for the patient. So 
it is a success. It was Avastin, as I said, was the first FDA uh, approved antiangenic um, uh, therapeutic, and it did demonstrate in the clinic that it is effective and that it can cure patients. But if you take the average, the overall is basically um, uh, the benefit is is measured in weeks or in a few in a few months. So it, it definitely, at least in my opinion, I think. In a lot of, uh, in the opinion of a lot of people in the angiogenesis field, field it didn't leave out, of the, uh, out to the expectations based on the preclinical um, um, studies. There is also a lot of uh, unsuccessful phase three clinical trials uh, with bevacizumab. Um, and again, bevacizumab and other antiangiogenic compounds. Um, uh, either alone and in combination with a lot of, you know, all kinds of different therapeutics. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, clinical trials in which we don't see progression to, free, uh, progression to free survival or overall survival. So on top of this, there are preclinical indications, and these are two papers that were published in the same number of cell, and I think in 2009, suggesting that treatment or chronic treatment with um, therapeutics that will target vascular endothelial growth factor pathway could have deleterious effects in terms of potentiating, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but potentiating uh, metastasis, potenti potentiating angiogenesis, and um, um, you already said um, um, metastasis. So this is obviously concerning. <laughs> and there are other publications that have corroborated this uh, data. Whether or not this is uh, seen in the clinic, I think is arguable, and I think is uh, a matter of discussion uh, at the moment. There is a bunch of publications that uh, focused on the fact that when you stop antiangiogenic therapy, tumors grow like crazy. So they, you can stop the growth of the tumors during the phase of administration. Once you, stu once you stop um, that therapy, the, the tumors come back even much more aggressively than they were initially. There are other um, publications like this one in here, and there is a number. I mean, this is not a comprehensive list. Like this one in here that talk about um, uh, related um, mortality with bevacizumab or, or Avastin. So Avastin seems to have some of these um, um, deleterious, basically, of her unintended um, consequences um, uh, in the clinic. In general, all antiangiogenic uh, therapeutics uh, have the problem that they are hypertensive. They cause hypertension. And this is just a problem with many or almost all antiangiogenic um, therapeutics. And you'll find you know, this over and over um, again in the, in the literature. Most of these uh, effects are manageable. Uh, some of these are not manageable. And um, in treatments with bevacizumab, uh, you may have like about four times uh, the chances of developing a pulmonary hemorrhage. You have about four times the uh, uh, chances of um, uh, developing gastrointestinal hemorrhage and other complications, which are obviously not manageable. So there are problems, basically, with, uh, with bevacizumab. So there's a lot of um, um, work being done to understand, is this a problem exclusively with bevacizumab? Is it a problem with other types of antiangenic therapeutics as well? Does this uh, you know, uh, uh, apply generally to uh, the vast majority of patients? Um, a slide to, to summarize basically the challenges on anti, on, uh, with antiangenic therapy. There is an obvious gap between the preclinic and the clinic. Um, and there are modest clinical benefits. Angiogenesis is a fundamental process both for homeostasis and embryo, and embryo development. And therefore, it's an extremely redundant uh, process. If you block one pathway, there's another pathway that is going to take over. You block those two, there's another pathway that is going to take over. So the, um, um, this represents a tremendous challenge in terms of, of uh, drug development. 
Um, we've already talked about adverse side effects. The mechanism of action is incompletely understood. This, in my opinion, is one of the most important things. We understand a lot of what happens in preclinical models or in vitro systems. When we go to the patients, uh, we really don't understand very well why bevacizumab is able to cure patients sometimes. We don't understand it very well. Uh, so this is one of the, in my opinion, one of the uh, major problems right now which is related to the last one that I um, uh, write here, which is the lack of biomarkers. Um, there are not good angiogenesis biomarkers overall uh, across the board. There are not good imaging biomarkers. There are not predictive or prognostic biomarkers. We don't have biomarkers to stratify patients. So bevacizumab is able to cure some patients. We just don't know which patient is going to get cured. Um, so this is uh, one. Uh, in my opinion, one of the major problems that we have right now. Um, what are the needs as, uh, as I see them? Well, we need a better understanding on you know, how the antiangenic therapy works in patients uh, related to this pointing here. We need predicted and prognostic biomarkers that will uh, help us basically stratify patients and to administer these therapeutics better. And one of the problems that Bevacizumab has is that uh, vascular endothelial growth factor is produced by tumor cells, but it's produced by inflammatory cells. It's necessary for homeostasis in our body. So it is not um, unthinkable that treatment with an anti-VEGF drug is going to affect basically the patient sometimes in dramatic ways. So what we need is we need targets, new targets that are specific for the tumor vasculature as opposed to you know, a proangiogenic factor that plays a role in um, a lot of different um, uh, physiological processes. So uh, uh, during the years, I've been involved in a, a number of efforts to try to tackle these, uh, these needs. And I'll show you uh, some of those. First, are there other targets, angiogenesis targets, apart from VEGF, or apart from some of the classic proangiogenic compounds? So this is a study that is uh, um, a bit old now, but I, uh, I like because what it shows is that, and this plot over here is showing the established microvascular genes with established microvascular function. And in this graph over here is showing other genes that they found that are related to microvascular function, but they, we never heard of, or you know, that there are not the classic um, uh, genes for microvascular function. And as you can see, there are actually more of these genes than in these genes in here, in this plot over here. So, so, the, so the answer is yes. There is plenty of targets. There is plenty of genes that are related to or that there are important for angiogenesis that we're just simply not looking at. Uh, the question is, how do you find which are these genes and which are important, which of these genes are more draggable or are more interesting from a therapeutic perspective? So, one of the, um, um, in my opinion, crucial moments um, uh, for angiogenesis from a therapeutic perspective occurred in, in, in 2000 when Brad Sankro, which is actually who is the PI in our group, uh, published a paper which I think is, is a hallmark in, in therapeutic angiogenesis. He looked at what was the transcriptome in tumor microvasculature and compared that to normal vasculature just to understand what genes, you know, are... Um, um, Upregulated, downregulated, differentially regulated in tumor mi uh, microvasculature. And he took a very interesting approach. Um, he actually did, uh, took different approaches, but this is one of them. Uh, he used the normal vasculature in normal resting liver as normal vasculature. He used a regenerating liver as, a, as an example of physiological angiogenesis. You cut a liver, the liver grows back, and that process is very much dependent on angiogenesis, and we can consider that physiological angiogenesis. And then, you know, he had some tumor-bearing uh, livers, which are um, his source for tumor vasculature. So he did, he used a, a SAGE uh, analysis uh, technology, basically, to compare the transcriptome between um, the vasculature and all these situations. And he came up with a number of what he called tumor endothelial markers. So these are markers, these are genes that are overexpressed in tumor vasculature when we compare to normal vasculature. And um, he did a lot of um, work not only to validate, but also to understand which 
ones of these genes were more interesting from a therapeutic perspective. So he came up with a number of genes that are membrane receptors. So he thought that you know, those will be um, more targetable than, than other genes. Um, and here are some, some publications that you know, uh, talk about all these uh, that I'm summarizing in, in, in a minute. But one of those genes um, is called TEM8, tumor endothelial marker 8. And um, he was able to develop a therapeutics for this particular gene. This gene is expressed. He demonstrated that it's expressed exclusively in the tumor of vasculature. He did analysis of the expression of TEM8 in uh, um, vasculature in, in, in a panel of diff um, different normal tissues, and who could never find it there, exclusively in the tumor of vasculature. And what was interesting is that he also developed a knockout for this particular gene. And the knockout shows absolutely no phenotype, except for a defect in teeth, in the teeth that are misaligned. So the knockouts are perfectly viable and normal. And um, however, when you grow a tumor in these, in these mice, um, the tumor growth is greatly delayed. So this will be the, the growth of the, of the tumor in the wild type, and this is the growth of the, um, of the tumor in the knockout littermates. So this result is not so surprising, and it's not surprising because what he was looking at, this tumor in the filial marker 8 is only exclusively overexpressing the tumors, and therefore, it's not surprising that if it doesn't play a role in normal physiology, these animals are perfectly normal. And you can only see the effects when in the context of, of uh, uh, tumor growth. He went ahead and developed antibodies uh, to target this particular uh, tumor endothelial market A. Um, the antibody is called L2. And as you can see, when um, uh, he treats the animals with his antibody, he observes a similar response to what happens with a knockout animal. And or even a similar degree of inhibition, of tumor growth inhibition, uh, suggesting that he's able basically to block pretty much all the TEM8 present um, overexpressed um, within the tumor. And he went ahead also and did a lot of different combinations with other chemotherapeutics and show that TEM8 um, synergistically acts with other either chemotherapeutics or other antiangiogenic compounds. Um, uh, to suppress tumor growth. And he was able to achieve also tumor-free um, animals in, in some of the studies that he did. Um, one, one experiment that I wish I would have uh, added in here is, which is, I think is beautiful, is in the same animal, he put in one side one tumor, and in the other side of the animal, he made a wound, OK? Uh, wound is, again, wound healing is very much dependent on angiogenesis. And he went ahead and treated that animal with this antibody, which is, again, a monoclonal antibody for TEM8. What happened is he was able to regress the tumor on that animal, but the wound healed at the same speed that in animals that were untreated. Again, one functional, basically, example that the antibody is basically having an effect on normal vascular, uh, I'm sorry, in tumor vasculature, but not in normal vasculature. Um, what other uh, approaches can we take to devise uh, novel targets for to target specifically the, uh, the tumor microenvironment? Well, in the process of drug development, there is always pretty much a process of high throughput screen of some sort. And in the previous presentation, you know, she was talking about these massive screens with um, RNAi. Um, in the past, I tried to devise a, a, a way to uh, come up with an in vitro assay that was meaningful from a, the perspective of tumor angiogenesis that could be used to screen um, uh, large uh, numbers of drugs. And this is the, um, a two-formation assay. I'm not sure you're familiar with this assay, but uh, it simply consists on generating a three-dimensional mi matrix of a gel that is composed of an extracellular matrix from a uh, tumor mouse, from a mouse tumor. So from this mouse tumor, we extract the extracellular matrix and generate these 3D gels. And on top of those gels, we add endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are basically on their environment, on their, on their uh, matrix. 
And this is basically what happens uh, when you do that. Hmm. Okay, there you go. So the cells, which initially are homogeneously distributed in the matrix, will rearrange to form those cords that you see in there that mimic the vasculature in the tumor microenvironment. So this is what is called a two-formation assay. We didn't invent it. It was, you know, it, it was, it's been around for a long time. But I thought that we could use this assay for, to do screenings, basically, of, of drugs. To make a long story short, this is just an example of some of those screenings that we did. And here uh, on the left, you have um, an assay where we didn't treat uh, these compounds, these cells, and that's not going to work, but basically it was doing exactly the same thing as in the previous, um, as in the previous image. And this is one of the compounds that we were able to found. This is uh, one of those assays treated with one of these compounds. Basically, the cells are able to move around freely in the matrix, so it's not blocking migration, it's not blocking viability of the cells, but it is blocking the ability of those cells to form tubes. Okay, so um, we went ahead and tested these compounds um, in preclinical uh, in preclinical models, and this is one of those compounds that I showed you before. And actually, in this particular experiment, we were testing two of these compounds. This is the growth of the of the normal tumor, and this is the growth down here of uh, two of these compounds compared with Avastin, which is uh, we've already talked is um, anti VEGF. Um, monoclonal antibody. So as you can see, we're, we were able to um, find, actually, as a matter of fact, these were the two compounds that we found in these screens. We just picked two. We saw, we did the whole screen, we picked two compounds, and these are the first two compounds that we tested in vivo. So uh, indicating that the assay is basically very robust in terms of finding um, uh, small molecules. In this case, these were small molecules that were effective in preclinical models um, of cancer. So these are just two examples of how you can go about using unbiased systems to find um, um, uh, drugs that are specific, more specific for the tumor microenvironment and that can be uh, potentially translated into the clinic. And I did promise that I will finish, and it's 10 off, 6, and I will take any questions that you might have at this point. Yes. In terms of what? As far as I'm, as far as I know, we haven't done any direct head-to-head -head comparison of both of them. I can tell you, Tomate um, uh, therapeutics for Tomate have have absolutely no toxicity whatsoever. One of the challenges with these um, um, targets is to really find um, whether or not they're expressed anywhere else in the body. There might be an obscure place, you know, uh, a, a cell type that we didn't look at, you know, that, that is expressing temate and where temate is functional and is necessary for homeostasis. And this is why all these experiments um, um, uh, doing, like, for instance, this experiment that I like so much where we do the wound and we do the tumor in the same animal and treat the animal, really demonstrate that, um, that the animals are not affected, or the, or the, or the therapeutics for tomato are not toxic in this animal. There's, there's an interesting paper that a collaborator of ours published last year which found um, um, this a group of patients that have GAPO syndrome. GAPO syndrome is, a, is an obscure syndrome that uh, produces some uh, growth retardation, uh, alopecia, certain, certain deformities which are, seem to be caused by accumulation of extracellular matrix. But these people are perfectly normal otherwise. You know, they, they live normal lives otherwise. So these people have uh, mutations on the TEMA gene. It's completely knocked out. They don't have TEMA at all. Right? And these people are relatively normal, apart from this accumulation of extracellular matrix. Interestingly, they had the effect on the teeth, the same, of, same as the mice, uh, the, uh, knockout mice. But that is a good indication that um, temate is not required for normal development and for 
and for uh, you know homeostasis in adults. So it's a, it's a good indication that therapeutics for Tamate won't have won't show basically any toxicity in, the, in patients. Yes. That's a very good question, and we're working really hard to understand that question. <laughs> so, um, Temate actually happens to, uh, you might have noticed in my slides that I also put another name in there. That is called anthrax receptor 1. So, it turns out that Temate is a receptor for anthrax. Obviously, it, it, uh, Temate did not evolve to be an anthrax receptor. And we do think that it has a, a function in normal physiology that is probably redundant to other genes. And so knocking down basically of Temet is not required for. And, and is, but is expression, you don't see a, a very expression in the So one of the very interesting experiments that Brad did a long time ago was he looked at normal uh, uh, places where uh, physiological antigenesis occurs, like for instance, the corpus luteum, right? He found absolutely not expression of TEM8. And this is why TEM8 is so, so attractive you know, to us, because it's really expressed in tumor of vasculature, and we can't find it anywhere else. And, and if you induce expression, then you cause If you induce forced expression in a transgenic? Yeah. Uh, we haven't done that, but. Uh, yeah, we haven't done it. Well, we can overexpress them, and of course, we have a lot of different systems where we have overexpressed them in vitro, and the cells don't seem to show any um, phenotype in terms of you know growth or morphology, any of those overt things that you will you will be able to see. Well, this is kind of like a, in my opinion, is kind of like a historical reason. Uh, this is an entire field in the search for one target that we can translate to the clinic. So uh, Genentech and Napoleon Ferrara made this antibody for VEGF, and it was the first FDA-approved drug, and they showed that it can't work in the clinic, and that attracted massive interest into VEGF. So that has done a lot of good for the field in, in terms of We've shown that we can, you know, translate these things in the clinic and it's effective. And, but at the same time, it's probably not the best target <laughs> because of all these things that we have discussed today, right? But it's probably a historical reason uh, from, from my perspective. I think you wanted to ask a question. So with your gene graphs, the phosphoracid gene graphs, are you looking at the endostatin results are very hard to reproduce. Uh, but yes, we are moving, or we're trying to move therapeutics, uh, um, in particular monoclonal antibodies for TEM8, to the clinic. Yes. More questions? Thank you very much.